baptism, penance, holy Eucharist, confirmation, holy orders, matrimony, the anointing of the sick. Be with us now as Father Frank Pavone leads us to a deeper understanding of the unique signs instituted by Christ on reflections of the sacraments. And now, Father Pavone. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. We welcome you to our continuation of the series of Reflections on the Sacraments, the seven sacraments instituted by Christ, these gifts that bring us His grace. The sacrament of baptism is what we've been reflecting on, and we have already reflected on the fact that we baptize uh, children and adults because Christ Himself commands Baptism. We read the uh, conclusion of Matthew's Gospel, go into the whole world, baptize all the nations, make them my disciples. And we reflected on the fact that baptism gives us a share in God's own life, washing away original sin, making us members of Christ, of the body of Christ, which is the Church. I'd like to um, point out that in that command that our Lord gives us at the end of Matthew to uh, baptize, He not only tells his apostles to baptize all nations, but then he gives them the harder part of the command, which is, teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you. It's relatively easy to perform the baptism ceremony. I've done hundreds of them myself. But it's another thing altogether. To take that person who has been baptized and to train them, to help them understand what this new life that they have received is all about, to teach them the difference between living as a child of God and living as a person who is following the ways of the world, to teach them to distinguish virtue from sin and to assist them to always say yes to the paths of virtue and the commandments of God. This is the challenge. Teach them to carry out Everything I have commanded you. The actual baptism of a person takes place in just a moment. Water is poured over the person's, uh, usually over their, their forehead, and the words are pronounced, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, because those are words given to us by Christ himself, if we do not use the proper words, the person is not baptized. Uh, A priest I know tells a a story that came down uh, uh, down through the years of of an old uh, cardinal who was uh, celebrating, I guess, some sort of a uh, of an anniversary. And uh, this is um, uh, this is a story showing the uh, the importance of baptism being done uh, uh, properly and as this uh, as this story goes he's uh, um, meeting all these people who are uh, congratulating him and this this old woman comes up to him and says oh yes he says i've known you all my life in fact i remember when i i myself baptized you you see anybody can baptize if there's a situation of an emergency you don't have to be a priest or a deacon, you can just, if you do it the right way, with the right formula, and pouring the water, and the right intention to do what the church does, anybody can baptize someone in an emergency, so this woman says, oh yes, in the hospital, she says, I baptize you myself, in the name of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and it's like everything else is invalid, if the baptism is not valid, then then you, you, you have not received confirmation, you've not received holy orders, you're not a priest or a bishop, you've got to go back and do it all over again. And uh, this is just a story, but it goes to show that um, the, every detail here of the of the uh, the actual administration of the sacrament needs to be properly observed. And uh, this is the case with with all the sacraments. There are certain things about them that are essential in order to do what the sacrament is supposed to do. But again, that actual moment comes and it goes rather simply. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then the challenge comes. Teach them to carry out everything 
that I have commanded you. And know that I am with you always until the end of the world. There is what gives the consolation to the difficult challenge. I am with you. I am with you parents who are trying to raise your children in the ways of God's commandments. I am with you until the end of the world. No matter how bad the world becomes, no matter how far off the track it goes, I am with you. No matter how many other messages they are getting from people all around them, I am with you to pass on to the children that you have brought to my church for baptism, to pass on to them the meaning of that life they've received and the strength to live it. I am with you. And of course, the primary responsibility for making sure that one who has been baptized lives his or her baptism, that primary responsibility rests with the parents. Parents, you are the primary religious educators of your children. The church is there to help you, but you have the primary responsibility. And this is why, brothers and sisters, we shouldn't be surprised that parishes require very often that uh, the parents of children being baptized should come for parents' classes and special sessions prior to the baptism ceremony. After all, they are doing this because they're responding to Christ's command, and his command is twofold, not only to baptize, but to teach them to carry out everything that he has commanded. And so the church wants to have a reasonable assurance that the one being baptized is also in a, in a circumstances where that new life will be, will be nurtured and cared for. And so we want to meet with the, the parents. And then, of course, this is where the godparents come in as well. What is the purpose of the sponsor or the godparent in baptism? Well, the individual, as the baptism ceremony mentions at the beginning, is meant to assist the parents of the child in the Christian upbringing of their child. The, the idea is that here the church is imparting this new way of life to this individual, so the individual needs good examples of what it means to live that new life. Whether the person is going to be faithful to his or her baptism or not depends on the people who live closest to that person, the parents, the, the sponsors, and the, the, the relatives. If the person's family is not giving the example of the Christian life, well then, they can receive the new life of God in baptism very easily, but they can lose it by sin just as easily. So that a step forward to God, thanks to baptism, is really a call to the entire family to come closer to God. And that's why we need to take the choice of Godparents very seriously, and we need to evaluate it according to this question. Who is best going to be able to help the parents of this child in their duty to bring up the child in the practice of the faith? And it's because this is a serious responsibility that the church has certain norms and, and guidelines for who is to be a sponsor. And this is why there are also classes and sessions that have to be held in, in, in parishes for the sponsors very frequently, or at least they need to present what we call a sponsor certificate. Now, in some places this may not be done, but it's extremely important because we, want, again, want to have some assurance that the, the person who is promising to teach this person the ways of the faith is living the ways of the faith themselves and knows the ways of the faith. So it has to be, first of all, a person of the faith, someone who himself or herself is baptized and is practicing the Christian life. Uh, it would be um, a contradiction to say that, um, well, I'm going to help pass on the uh, Christian faith and life uh, to this child, but I don't believe in Christ. That wouldn't make sense. Nobody can give what he doesn't have. Godparents, furthermore, need to be in, in good standing uh, with the uh, with the church, if a Catholic godparent comes forward and uh, is um, not living in accordance with the church's teachings, what kind of example would that give to the child? And then this person needs to stand there in the in the ceremony and promise to give that good example to the child. Well, very simply put, the church does not want to put people in an impossible situation or in a contradictory situation, and that's why we want to make sure that godparents are properly 
prepared for the task ahead of them. Now, if they are not properly prepared, we're very glad to to prepare them and to help them. And this is why they should be chosen uh, early and uh, be in touch with the the priest as early as possible. Now, the primary element that is used in the ceremony of baptism is water. And when we look at Scripture, we see the power of this symbol of water from the beginning to the end. I'm going to take you on a brief scriptural journey in regard to the meaning of water. And then the use of water in baptism will be all the more meaningful to us, not only in baptism, but, you know, when we go in and out of the Catholic Church, we bless ourselves with holy water. Do you know why? It's because we're reminding ourselves that we were baptized. We're reminding ourselves that thanks to the water that was poured on us, we are now sons and daughters of God, sharing His own life. The water sign of life. It's there at the very beginning of Scripture, the very first page. When we read about the creation of the world, we read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. The waters. You see this image of the Spirit of God hovering over water, and what will happen, as we read further down in the, in the first chapter of the Bible, from that water there will arise the gift of life. So we have here like an original womb of the world. We were all once in the womb. We were in the, the amniotic fluid, which was a, an original water for us, from which we, in which we grew and from which we emerged. Here you have this this original water of the dawn of creation. And then as God does create everything and he creates our first parents, Adam and Eve, we read in the second uh, chapter of Genesis that uh, in verse 10 it says, a river rises in Eden to water the garden. There is a, a river right there at the beginning of human history. We go further into the scriptures and we encounter in the book of Exodus the central event of the Old Testament, the crossing of the Red Sea by the Israelites. And by the way, brothers and sisters, the water parted, the sea opened. This miracle really happened. Don't let people tell you that the miracles of the Bible weren't really miracles. Let me tell you, we all believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. If God could make everything out of nothing... It's no big deal for him to move a little bit of water around. That's exactly what he did for the Israelites. They come to the to the Red Sea, and they've been they've been chased literally out of Egypt because of the the God sending the plagues to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. And finally, he 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 lets them go, and the Egyptians chase them out because they were afraid of the this final plague, the death of the firstborn, and, and they're afraid maybe they will they will all die and. So they say, please go, leave our land. And so the Israelites go, but then Pharaoh's heart is hardened once again and he goes after them with his chariots and charioteers and they end up uh, with the uh, Red Sea on one side of them and Pharaoh's army on the other. And, and, And Moses says, be still and see what the Lord God will do for you today. And he lifts up his staff according to the command of God and the Red Sea opens and the people go through the Red Sea, and the soles of their feet don't even get wet. And when they get to the other side, what happens? The sea flows back to its normal depth. And Pharaoh and his chariots and charioteers are drowned in the sea. The water here, for the Israelites coming through the Red Sea, has a double image. It is for them the way to life, the way into the promised land, And it is, at the same time, that which destroys the power of evil. The water itself conquered the enemies of the people of God, who were oppressing them. Now, this double symbolism of the water continues in all the various scriptural references that we have, and and then ultimately in the sacrament of baptism itself, because on the one hand, what is happening 
is that the evil of sin, original sin and any other personal sins which an older person who is being baptized has committed, they're all washed away. So the water still is destroying the evil. And at the same time, it is giving new life and leading that person into the promised land, which is nothing other than, than, than the life of God, sharing in the life of God. Let's go on. In, in Exodus, uh, once the um, people pass through the Red Sea, we read in the 17th chapter of Exodus, a marvelous um, a story, about the water from the rock. The people reach a, a particular point in their journey where there was no water for them to drink. And, and so in 17, verse 2, it says, They quarreled, therefore, with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to a test? Here then, in their midst, in their thirst for water, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you ever make us leave Egypt? Was it just to have us die here of thirst with our children and our livestock? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? A little more, and they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go over there in front of the people, along with some of the elders of Israel, holding in your hand as you go the staff with which you struck the river. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock in Horeb. Strike the rock, and the water will flow from it for the people to drink. This Moses did in the presence of the elders of Israel. Strike the rock, God said to Moses. St. Paul will refer to this in his um, first letter to the Corinthians. Let's go there for a moment. Because the rock is going to be... Uh, mentioned here by uh, Paul as well as the Red Sea. In 1 Corinthians 10, St. Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all of them were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. The rock was Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's the Son of God, is eternal. And the Old Testament speaks about Christ just as the New Testament does, but it does so in a different manner. It does so in the manner of signs, symbols, and foreshadowings. But the rock was Christ. And the rock being struck with the staff is a foreshadowing of his being crucified, and the water that flowed from the rock is the life that flows from Christ. And we will see that happening literally on the cross, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a few moments. But St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians uses the word baptism in referring to the passage of the Israelites through the Red Sea, and then refers to a legend that this rock um, which, which Moses struck continue to follow them on their journey. Now, we don't read about this in Scripture, but it is a legend that the rock continued to follow them and continue to provide a fountain of water for them to drink. God is saying important things here about how he's going to save us in Christ. Now, in the um, book of Psalms, we have a, one of the Psalms, which is probably the most popular Psalm that there is, and it, it's a very sacramental psalm, which is an aspect of the psalm that we might not think of, but it's Psalm 23, a psalm which really um, we should have memorized. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. In green pastures you let me graze, to safe waters you lead me, you restore my strength. Let's stop there for a moment. To safe waters you lead me. Which waters? The waters of baptism which, as the ceremony says, make an end of sin and a new beginning of goodness. The psalm goes on, You guide me along the right path for your name's sake. Even though I walk through a dark valley, I fear no harm. For you are at my side. Your rod and staff give me courage. Now listen in this next verse to the Eucharistic reference and also to the reference to Confirmation. You set a table before me as my enemies watch, the table of the Eucharist. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
the oil of confirmation. There's also oil in baptism, which we will refer to later. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of the life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. And that's exactly what the sacraments do for us, starting with baptism. They introduce us into the house of the Lord. There's a fascinating passage, uh, again, tying into this whole theme, in uh, the book of the prophet Ezekiel, in chapter 47, almost at the very end of uh, this uh, prophecy. And it's a passage about the wonderful stream. What happens in this passage is that uh, Ezekiel is brought to the entrance to the temple, and he says, I saw water flowing out from beneath the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the facade of the temple was toward the east. The water flowed down from the southern side of the temple south of the altar. Uh, now, he, he moves on, and in the course of describing this, the water becomes deeper and deeper. And uh, it begins to, to uh, become a river that Ezekiel says could not be crossed except by swimming. And uh, the angel of the Lord asks him, Have you seen this son of man? And then he brought me to the bank of the river where he had me sit, Along the bank of the river I saw very many trees on both sides. He said to me, This water flows into the eastern district, down upon the Araba, and empties into the sea the salt waters which it makes fresh. Wherever the river flows, every sort of living creature that can multiply shall live, and there shall be abundant fish. For wherever this water comes, the sea shall be made fresh." Further down, along the banks of the river, fruit trees of every kind shall grow. Their leaves shall not fade, nor their fruit fail. Every month they shall be watered by the flow from the sanctuary. Their fruit shall serve for food, and their leaves for medicine. Now, notice something. The water was flowing from the temple. Who do you think the temple is? In John's Gospel, the Lord says in um, chapter 2, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John 2.20 continues, The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? Verse 21, But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Go 17 more chapters, and in John 19, we read, Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. Christ is the temple from which the water flows. Christ is the rock from which the water flows. Christ is the Savior from which the waters of salvation flow to each of us and continue to flow to each of us through the church. There's a beautiful prayer in the baptism ceremony when the water itself is being blessed before it is poured over the child or the adult, as the case may be. And the, the prayer says at a certain point, it makes reference, in fact, to many of these scripture passages that I've referred to. It makes reference to the waters at the dawn of creation and to the waters of the Red Sea and the prophets. And then it says, O Lord, unseal the fountain of baptism. The church is our mother. And in the waters of the womb of the church, the fountain of baptism, we are all born to a new and eternal life. Eternal, brothers and sisters, because it is the life of the eternal God, and it will never end. 
and as we saw the river of life-giving water referred to in the first chapter of the Bible, we likewise see it in the last chapter of the Bible. Because in the book of Revelation chapter 22, when John is being this, given this vision of heaven, the chapter opens this way, Then the angel showed me the river of life-giving water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, down the middle of its street. On either side of the river grew the tree of life that produces fruit twelve times a year, once each month, and the leaves of the tree serve as medicine for the nations. Now you may recognize those verses because that's the same thing that was said in Ezekiel chapter 47. Use holy water frequently as a reminder of the marvelous waters of baptism. What a rich symbol this is. You know, when I baptize babies, I use lots of water. I'm not satisfied with using just a little cup or, or a little container. I get one of these big salad bowls, you know, and I fill it up with water, and there's a rich symbol. And, you know, you can... Uh, um, by the way, and just a little piece of advice to my brother priests and deacons, warm up the water, because if you, if you haven't seen by experience, it, the babies do much better when the water is a little bit warm. They'll, they'll cry a little bit less. But it's marvelous, and, and, and we thank God for the gift of water that has been, been used throughout salvation history. We thank Him for, for baptizing us in the waters of new life. And we thank you for listening to this series. It's a pleasure for me to be with you. I'm Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life, and we'll continue our reflections on the sacraments. And meanwhile, let's pray for all people that they may receive the gift of eternal life. Thank you for joining us for Reflections of the Sacraments, presented by Father Frank Pavone, Director of Priests for Life.